I want to begin with this question. How many of you, raise your hand uh, if this applies to you, how many of you work in a job where, where you work with software? Okay, how many of you work in a job? How many of those who have your hands raised, how many of you have occasional um, changes in software? I heard a little groan. <laughs> how do you feel about those occasions when you have changes in software? You got new, better, improved, faster software now. Lost. <laughs> and so what are you feeling? Frustration. I'm feeling frustration because I just learned the old one. Right? Bill? Job security. Job security. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's that's the thing. If you're if you're an expert in that area like Bill is, that's job security. Um what the reality is for most of us, especially as we get older, not that any of us in here are older, but if we and when we get older, um, we get comfortable with the things that we're familiar with. And when somebody comes along or something comes along and disrupts our comfort and disrupts our familiarity with something new, our reaction is to be frustrated. frustrated. Do you understand why they crucified Jesus now? Although what Jesus shared and what Jesus introduced was actually not something new, it was something, as we'll see tonight, that had been prophesied for hundreds of years. And yet when the fulfillment of the prophecy came through the life of Jesus Christ, the reaction particularly of the religious leaders who were jealous of Jesus' popularity, who felt threatened by his, um, their status was being threatened by his new way of the spirit. Um, <laughs> They want to get rid of it. And so you could say, in a way, that Jesus was killed because of something new. Um, I hope that that would forever put to bed any of our concerns about rejecting something simply because it's new. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I understand it. I understand. I'm one of those people who's dealt with those uh, software changes. I hate it. Okay. You know, uh, I, I, I grumble under my breath. I'm, I'm like Julie. I just now learned the old one. What are you doing changing it to something new? But newness shouldn't be something that scares us. It shouldn't be something that we reject out of hand. And so we're going to look at why that might be tonight, especially as we look at the new way of the Spirit. Okay? So let's read uh, Romans chapter 6. Somebody read verses 1 through 4. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from death through the glory of the Father, we too live, we too may live. All right, God promised newness of life when we meet the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as we reenact the gospel through baptism and connect to the cleansing blood of Christ. Yet some 
people are not sure what to expect when they are born again. So this is this is sharing time here to begin with, personal sharing time. What did you expect to happen when you came out of the waters of baptism? What did you expect to happen? No more problems. No more problems. Thank you for being honest, because I think that's probably what a lot of people expect. Others, what do you what did you expect? Relief. I heard relief from something. Relief. relief from what? Well, you know, you grow up and you watch people being baptized, and I'm thinking, well, I need to do that. That's something I need to do. I don't think any time was ever march down to I overcame my fears, I overcame my apprehensions, so I finally did it. Whew. Relief. Someone else, what did you expect to happen? Continual excitement. Just Continual oh, yeah. excitement. High all the time. All right? I, just, I felt like I was loved by God, and I did something good that God was happy with. Okay, you, you felt like you'd done something good that God would be happy with. What else did you expect? To happen to feel different. Well, what different? How different did I you expect? No, I just I just thought I would feel different. Okay, you just you you expected to feel different, but didn't know what that meant for God. Well, the reality is, when we are baptized into Christ, um, there is a newness of life because that's what God's word promised. I've seen people weep in the baptistry. I've, people, I've seen people jump up and scream with excitement. And then I've seen people with a smile on their face that uh, seems unable to be washed away. They know something significant has taken place, but I've also known people who expected, as uh, Nora said, not to struggle as much as they did. I've seen people who didn't know the allies in Christ that they had, like the Holy Spirit. Or what meant. Or what, it, or what having the Holy Spirit meant uh, as an ally. And I've seen some who were just going through the motions to please other people. Did any of you experience that sometimes the initial enthusiasm more off. Did anybody experience the initial enthusiasm wearing off? I think what I experienced was yes, change, but I I actually kind of felt fearful because there needed to be a lot of change for me. And I was always afraid that I wasn't gonna live up to expectations. That God expected. All right. I, I, God, I know you're expecting good things from me. I, I hope that I don't disappoint you. Right. hope I don't let you down. Here's the question I want to ask you now. Why did the initial enthusiasm wear off? What? Life happened. What does that mean? The devil creeps in. I heard a voice. <laughs> <laughs> what? When you're fighting the devil. All right. You, you felt at some point beaten down by the devil. Okay. Why does the initial enthusiasm wear off? You change, but nothing else around you did. Okay. You change, but nothing else around you changes. Keep yeah. going. I had the determination to keep going to church because I was, I was believed to. I would be Catholic, and I was invited to church. And to trust God to keep going to church, I just believed that uh, I had more of like a responsibility to keep on learning. But I had people that I looked up to, that I knew that they were, that they would depend on me too, and I had to. Not only be faithful, but I have to keep learning. But I didn't know it all. So you felt the need to continue to persevere and 
responsibility to uh, to be responsive to God. Why did the initial enthusiasm wear off? Because once you reach a goal, where else do you go after that? That's just your only goal. So So I reached my goal. If you didn't hear Amy, she makes a very important point here. If I've reached my goal, if I'm now a Christian, where else do I go? What else is there? If I think I have reached the pinnacle, and let me just say kind of parenthetically, I'm sad to say that I think a lot of times we preached baptism as though that was the pinnacle goal. And I don't ever want to minimize the significance of baptism, but I don't want to elevate it to the pinnacle goal either. Okay. So I, especially when you're 12 years old, or especially yeah. you talk about not understanding a lot of things. If, you know, if you if you've been taught all your life, you, know, you need to be baptized. You get to 12, and you do it, and where do you go from there? Okay. I kept wondering about what it would feel like to receive Holy Spirit. All right. And after baptism, you just going to happen. So, what would that feel like? What would the Holy Spirit living in me feel like? So, what what often happens is our expectations are not what they should be when we make a commitment to Christ. Okay. Okay. When they did those decisions about Jesus, when he gets baptized by John, and he says, I have this, we have to do it. I have to do it. Right. John said, No, you have to. Okay. Why? What spirit took Jesus on the mountain for temptation? What spirit of that? That's a spirit of temptation. Okay, you're jumping way ahead. That is in a later lesson, okay? That is in the lesson on walking with the Spirit, okay? Uh, if you didn't hear the question, it was about why uh, the Spirit would lead after Jesus' baptism would lead him into the wilderness to be tempted. That is in the lesson on walking with the Spirit. So we will talk about that later, all right? So for now, we're going to... We're going we're gonna to really focus in on this. And what I want you, as we go through this lesson, to understand is that there are times, perhaps in the teaching that we have received, that we have been, let's own it, that we have concluded some things develop some expectations that the Bible never says that we should have had in the first place. So with that introduction, let's look at what the new way of the Spirit is. Okay? Uh, turn your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 31. This is Jeremiah's prophecy about the new covenant and like he does so often the Hebrew writer will recall these prophecies so if somebody read Jeremiah 31 31 through 34 behold the days are coming says the Lord and I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by, by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their mind and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor. And every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. 
for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Okay, keep your finger there and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Verses uh, 15 through 18. Somebody read those verses, please. Okay, <clears throat> through Jeremiah, God prophesied that he was going to make a new covenant. Why? And what was new about it? How, how was it different from the old covenant? Okay, first, let's answer the first question, why? Why did God see the need to make a new covenant? All right. One reason is they broke the old covenant rather uh, openly and uh, freely. What else? It wasn't adequate. It wasn't adequate. What, what, what was it not adequate to do? To follow through. All right. The first covenant was not a covenant through which you could be ultimately forgiven. The Hebrew writer will also say the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sins. Okay? So, it just reminded people of their sins every year they made sacrifice. They didn't forgive sins, just kept reminding. Um, when you have a different type of relationship. You usually end, uh, enter into it through a covenant agreement. When we see a couple stand before God and the assembly of people and they make vows, they're entering into a new type of relationship and it's being carried out through this covenant that they are making with one another, right? So, with the coming of Jesus Christ, God was making a new covenant. So, this was not a relationship with God that would be based on law. This would be based on what Jesus had done or did through the cross and having a relationship with God through him. Thus, there was a new covenant. So what was new about it? What was new about it? All right. One of the things is that the sacrifice under the new covenant was Jesus Christ. Okay. Continually flow. It wasn't like you had to stop and kill a man. His blood didn't actually cover your sins. It just made you cover, well, it covered them for time, but it, it, Jesus' blood continually gloves. I mean, sure, even though we make gobs and gobs of mistakes, it's continually covering us to go to him. The writer of Hebrews makes this point several times about a sacrifice once for all time. You don't have to come back next year or next week or tomorrow when you sin and make another sacrifice and another sacrifice and another sacrifice. His blood is sufficient once for all time. What else is unique about the new covenant? Like I said earlier, I think the forgiveness of sin is forgiving. Yeah. 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 All right. The old covenant was actually a reminder of sin each each time you made a sacrifice under the new covenant the sins are forgotten by God. Mike. It's no longer a covenant that you're born into and taught that you're in covenant with God. Now you have to know God first so that you can get into covenant with him. 
So it was, um, it was a different kind of relationship that we would have through Jesus Christ, a, a different way of knowing him. How is knowing God different under the new covenant than the old covenant? Through? Through Jesus Christ. I don't go, I have to go to a high priest or a priest. I go through Jesus Christ. Come on in to the throne room, the invitation is. And in the Old Testament, God looked directly on their sin. And now he doesn't have to look at our sin directly because Christ covers us. Am I, am I just making that up in my head? A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's, it's really, really nice. Uh, make sure you're drawing, but, but, it is, but it is a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but the reality is, and, and this is where you're headed with this. The reality is um, the blood of Jesus cleanses. The blood of Jesus is sufficient. The blood of Jesus is all that's needed to take away the most ugly, the most uh, monumental, the biggest pile of sin, whatever it is, nothing, nothing, nothing is too big for his blood to forgive. Nothing. Praise God. Okay. It's a serious thing too. It's a serious thing because you have one sin and you can sin in it again and keep up. You can't be a phony asking God for forgiveness for that sin. You have to understand that does God does forgive and you can't do it, keep repeating that. We we don't we don't want to treat God's grace with uh, not seriously with contempt. Now here's another another difference. The old covenant was just a guardian, Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 20, uh, 24 and 25, until the coming of Christ. And the old covenant taught what was right and wrong, but as was mentioned, it could only point out where you were wrong and sin, but it couldn't say. Um, the new covenant would be written in the minds and hearts of believers to where we would know God personally. And as was mentioned, not just know about him for a prophet or priest, because under the new covenant, who's a priest? Jesus. We are a holy priesthood. holy priesthood. That you didn't make up. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. We are a holy priesthood. And so this would happen by the work of the Holy Spirit. Because he is the one who testifies and transforms. Okay? 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 8. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God, not that we are competent to claim anything for ourselves but our competence comes from god he has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter kills but the spirit gives life now if the ministry that brought death which was engraved in letters on stone came with glory so that the israelites could not look steadily at the face of moses because of its glory fading though it was Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Thank you for reading the Word of God with a, an enthusiasm and passion that it deserves. Okay. Um, here Paul compares the old covenant given through Moses with the new covenant given through Christ. 
And he says, if the old covenant was glorious. Now, here's a mistake we don't want to ever make. There are some people who have looked at the Old Testament as though we need we don't we don't need to ever go back there because that's old, it's antiquated, it's it's been replaced. Uh, it was a failed covenant. No, what scripture actually says about it is that it was glorious. But he said if the old covenant was glorious. Think how glorious the new covenant is. Yeah. Okay, well, now wait a minute. What have we said about the old covenant? It couldn't save you. You had to make sacrifices regularly that only reminded you of your sin. And he says it was glorious. So here's the question. What makes the new covenant more glorious than the old covenant? In particular, read the text that we just read. What does he say makes it more glorious? Confidence. Why do we have confidence and boldness? All right, so we can have confidence because of what Jesus Christ has done. What else is there? All right. The Gentiles were part of this new covenant. What else? All right. It's not, it's, it's not based on what we've done. It's based on what Jesus has accomplished. What does he say about the spirit? Well, it was fading on Who was saying it? She wants the answer. If it was light, that's not what she said first. Say it out loud. The spirit gives us light. He said... He said the law that was written on stone. What do you say about that? Okay. It's, it's, it's really the old covenant, though glorious, was a was written on stone instead of the new covenant, which was what? Written on our hearts. How does it get written on our hearts? I think I'm well, Christ, but the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit writes it on our hearts. When the Holy Spirit is in control of your life, I, you don't have to be told, don't steal. When the Holy Spirit is in control of your life, you don't have to be told, don't commit adultery. When the Holy Spirit is in charge of your life, you don't have to be told, don't covet. <coughs> you don't have to be told, don't worship idols. Why? Because that is known as it's written on your heart. The old covenant, Moses got in front of the people, had the stone tablets, read the stone tablets. Here's what you don't do. Here's what you do do. Um, and go follow. Also, I think sometimes important is the faded. And the glory of God does not fade. Right. Yeah. 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 Chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, we would say, see, not only does it not fade, in Christ there's ever-increasing glory. Okay? this What we have under Jesus Christ is not something that wears out, fades, rusts, gets old. It is something that is more beautiful every day. That's pretty remarkable uh, when you think of it. Um, and as Virginia said, the law brings death. The spirit brings life. And so 
rather than trying to follow rules by my own power, which always leaves me guilty, I have life in the Holy Spirit. So the issue is this. The issue under the Spirit is not try harder. How many of you have gone through much of your life with the attitude of try harder? You're not getting over that sin? What's wrong with you? You need to try harder. I'm not really deal with the Spirit, really, is what I mean, if you were really filled with the spirit. <laughs> so, so uh, shamed and and guilted, even uh, in in terms of of it tying to the spirit. Well, what we need to do under the spirit is die to ourselves more, and let the spirit revive us. We become then living sacrifices. All the way back, and we've already talked about this in one of the previous lessons, all the way back to the beginning on the day of Pentecost, it has never been about us and our own power. It's always been about God and his power. Okay? Isn't and so... And, and so that's another reason why perhaps the Holy Spirit has often taken a back seat, been tucked away in the corner, is because when we talk about him, we talk about God's empowerment rather than what we do. Okay? And so it's a whole different view, and that's the new way of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 3. Let's read verses 1 through 14. Foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? For your very eyes, Jesus Christ is clearly portrayed as crucified. I'd like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, or by believing what you heard? Were you so foolish? At the beginning, by means of the Spirit, were you not trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give you his spirit to work miracles among you by the works of the law, or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then, those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written over the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. How many of you grew up with only the three commands uh, uh, don't don't use drugs don't have sex and don't listen to rock and roll okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not listening to rock and roll um, see, we didn't even have 10 commands. We just had three. Okay. 
And what what Paul is pointing out here is I don't care what list you want to come up with. I mean, you come up with your own uh, do's and don'ts list. What does he say about the whatever law you come up with? Why are you cursed? Cause what? You can't live up to it. But you're trying to do human something, and that's why you can't live up to it because you're not ever going to be able to as a human. When I'm trying to, by my own power, be perfect, when I'm trying. To make sure I've got more checks on this side than X's on this side. First of all, how successful are you like to be? Well, the reality is a lot of people have lived for hundreds of years thinking I'm a good person because I have more pluses than I have more minuses in the way that I keep score. And that last part's pretty important, okay, in the way that I keep score. But the reality is we're not very successful. And when you think that you're someone who has more positives than negatives, what does that have to do to your attitudes? Get yeah. it. You get arrogant, you become self-righteous, you begin to look down at people who, they're not living up to my standards. You And it makes us feel good to see those people. We like those people, okay? We like those people, because you make me feel good about me. Because you're pretty despicable, you know? <laughs> we kind of enjoy despicable people. If we're self-righteous, okay? So again, Paul is trying to help us understand not to put our trust in law. Apparently, the Galatian Christians were a little uncomfortable with freedom in Christ. Keeping the law as imperfectly as they did seemed more quantifiable. I've got more positives and negatives on the ledger sheet, at least as I keep score. So I feel good about that. Okay. And that's the way a lot of us feel or have felt, right? Honestly, isn't it? A lot of us have said, okay, as long as I got more pluses, I know I got minuses, but those pluses, are, you know, they're keeping me in the game. All right? That's more quantifiable. Faith seems so ambiguous. Paul uses strong language here to persuade the Galatian Christians to follow the truth of freedom in Christ. What is the relationship between faith, law, and the Holy Spirit? Now, again, I want to make this clear. Though the law is good and spirit-filled, spirit-inspired, Romans chapter 7, 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 8, talk about the law being good. The law is inadequate to give life, to give hope, to give salvation. And again, I don't care what your law is, what it is. You, you make up whatever laws you want to make up. It cannot bring you salvation. It cannot bring you hope. It cannot bring you life. Okay? No law can do that. Our trust must be, we learn from Abraham, in who? Our trust must be in Jesus Christ in the same way that Abraham believed that what God said was true and that God would do whatever God said he would do. And so when Jesus says he's going to do something, what do we do? We believe that he's going to do what he said he's going to do. That's trust. Okay. That's the faith that God is looking for. Our trust, our faith, my brothers and sisters, is not in faith. Okay, catch that. Our faith is not in faith. <clears throat> Our faith is not in the law. Our faith is not in obedience. 
Our faith is not in baptism. Our faith is not in circumcision. Remember the Jews having quite a discussion about all that. Our faith is not in Moses. Our faith is not in Abraham. Our faith is not in Paul. Where must our faith be? Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. And that, that's a game changer. Okay? It's a game changer when you see that my salvation is truly wrapped up in what Jesus did on that cursed tree. And in that resurrection, three days later, all of a sudden, all this pressure to somehow perform for God is taken away and replaced by a gratitude that makes me want to please him. There is a huge difference. There is a huge difference between me trying to perform to earn God's favor and me out of gratitude and love. Uh, and, and humility wanting to please him because of what he's done for me. Hebrews 10 says that by one sacrifice, Christ made us become perfect. And under young law, they had to every year remember their sins with guilt. They had guilty conscience. Yeah. We can wake up in the morning and realize that we don't have to feel guilty about because Christ is forgiving them. This is the new way of the spirit. Okay? It is not in the old way of the law. And why we would ever want to go back to the law seems crazy. And so Paul refers to Abraham, who came before the law was given, to talk about what God is looking for. And God is looking for us to have faith like Abraham. There was no law in Abraham, but Abraham's faith is what pleased God. That's what God's looking for from us. We have faith and confidence in Jesus Christ. That's the new way of the Spirit. Okay? Romans, let's pick up those verses there. Romans 2.29. Somebody read that, please. And the other, other two as well. But a Jew is born inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the latter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Okay. Uh, Romans 7, verse 6. But we, now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. There's that phrase in the new way of the spirit and in 1417. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Okay. I, I want to make sure you understand this, especially in this in this particular question. You notice I picked one verse out of several places and I, I don't ever want to uh, proof text things okay um, I would much rather us be able to spend the time to read all the t context of this to understand what's being talked about that's ideal but for time constraints I'm just pulling those verses to make the point and putting them together not hopefully out of context so that you understand, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to proof text here. I want us to see the new way of the Spirit. He talks about, again, in the, in the letter to the Romans, that the law showed what is right and wrong. So what is the new way of the Spirit? In your own words now, from what we've read in Romans, with what we've talked about previously, what is the new way of the Spirit? Freedom. <laughs> what do you mean, freedom? Um, 
God through the Spirit really is abiding in me because of what Jesus Christ has done, and I have freedom there. Freedom from the guilt of sin. You don't have to carry both and all the sin that you've done. And a lot of us have or are carrying a lot of suitcases. You don't have to carry them. Leave them at the cross. The only thing that I can do is that this kind of brings to mind when he said, try hard, try hard. I don't think he talked about forgiving yourself. Again, <laughs> we need to prefer to forgive ourselves. God's always forgiven us, but we thought to forgive ourselves in order for him to forgive us. And give us in the right mind. And, and I understand I understand what you're saying, Lisa, about forgiving self, but really um, it is a matter of faith to trust God. Because it's it oh, let me finish. If I have a hard time forgiving myself, it's because I am not demonstrating enough faith in what God has said. God has said, I've forgiven. If I can't forgive me, I'm, I'm kind of placing myself above God. Well, you can't really forgive me. I mean, I've, uh, no, I can. I can. I can. So, again, a sufficient, a sufficient faith in his word that it really is true. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt. I just said it, it's easier to forgive us. Yeah, it's very hard to forgive. Yes. And, and even Paul struggled with that some, apparently. I mean, because he calls himself the worst of sinners. He, he refers to his past and, uh, and marveled. The, the, you know what he always said when he was talking about that? He said, but God poured out his grace. That's the what that's the focus that needs to be. That's the new way of the spirit where God has poured out his grace on me, despite me being the worst of sinners. That's what Paul focused on when he talked about his own past. Okay, yeah. so that will enable us to forgive. Let me let me move on a little bit. The new way of the Spirit has to do with the unseen work that goes on within a person's heart. It's not about outward images or even simply obedience. For instance, circumcision, circumcision, even that obedience was meant to symbolize the depth of intimate commitment being made it's dying to following rules to be led by a holy being who will make us holy law was made for lawbreakers as converts to christ we gladly submit to the leading of the holy spirit in the new way of the spirit we throw off the anxiety of whether i've been good enough or done enough and the meaningless, heartless following of traditions and rituals so that we can experience righteousness, peace, and joy from the heart. That's the new way of the Spirit. Not only do we experience freedom from our junk, from our past, from our sins, we experience freedom from Going through the motions. I don't have to go through the motions. I don't have to play the game. There's life in the spirit. That's what Jesus came to give. He came to give life and give it to the full. That's the new way of the spirit. Most of us in here probably have been more accustomed to a religion than we have to the new way of the spirit. And what I'm hoping is happening through the class as we talk about the Holy Spirit 
is that we're having a renewed appreciation for what God has done for us and that it revives us. We let the spirit bring us to life. And that we not be afraid of that. We welcome it and celebrate it. Okay? That's my hope. Last question. Clearly, Christ ushered in a new day when he visited the earth and endured the cross. In your own words, what do we have in Christ and the Holy Spirit that generations before Christ did not have? What do we have? Direct line to God. Direct line to God. Keep going. Confidence. Assurance. Assurance. We don't have to get up every day wondering if we're truly, oh, okay, so I'm good, good, da, da, da. You know what? He, as long as we're holding on to our sins, we cannot do the work of the Lord. we got to let go. We've got to do the work of the Lord. That's, and because you just can't not. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I like your passion. <laughs> it's good. Okay. It's, you know. Remember when Jesus healed those 10 lepers? And nine of them did what? Just went on their way. Just went on their way. And one came back and said, Thank you. And what did Jesus say? Where are the others? Weren't were there 10 of you? Mm -hmm. Are you the only one who is thankful for what has happened to you? My brothers and sisters, when we're all thankful for what has happened to us, uh, what Wendy just did won't seem out of order. Okay. Now she'll come up with new things, <laughs> but it won't be that out of order. Okay. Allow the spirit to live in us and it's going to it's going to, to to come out in a lot of ways primarily and this is a later lesson in changing our character to be like jesus okay have a blessed spirit-filled